Um, one of the things it's, uh, it's going to give me great pleasure uh, uh, to do just now uh, is to introduce uh, our final guest of the afternoon. Um, uh, Martha Schwartz uh, was, I think, living in New York by the time the competition that ended up in Exchange Square uh, was taking place. And uh, as she was working in the evening on the drawings for Exchange Square, one of her teenage children uh, came into the room, looked at the drawings and said something to the effect of, gee, mom, great for skaters. Um, you might have noticed um, skateboarding is banned in the center of the city. Uh, I suspect that might be something that Martha will have a few comments on. Martha Schwartz. I can't see anything anyway, that's all right. Um, uh, I am really delighted to be asked to speak here, and I felt that I had to come here because I care a lot about Exchange Square, and I care about what its role has been in the city of Manchester and what it, what it might be um, in the next 20 years. Uh, before I get started, I know I only have 30 minutes, and I really apologize because I'm actually going to read something that I've written so I don't get off track, but I'm going to get off track anyway. But, Luke, I just wanted to say that I'm a big fan of rock and roll. Um, obviously, I'm American. I take great pride in that, you know, we invented rock and roll, and it's been our best export ever, but it's impossible not to have rock and roll come out of a shithole. So, just, just saying, okay. Um, uh, I actually, uh, I tend to take the topics of these symposiums um, seriously. I don't know why, um, but I do. And uh, basically, in trying to deconstruct yeah, the language of the symposium notes, which I have to say were, was difficult, uh, they seem to boil down to a few major points of view. Uh, the first one is uh, that the bureaucratic regime of the city planning, um, and I assume your reference is to Manchester, has a pro-gentrification agenda. Uh, I'm not uh, disputing that. I'm actually not going to speak to that because it's so complicated. I mean. I am getting kicked out of our office in London because they've just jacked up the rent 300% and we're going to Brixton, yay. Uh, but uh, it's too complicated a discussion. That's really at least a few symposiums worth. But second was the importance of making places that will engender transculturalism and better serve diverse communities. Third was the crisis of homogeneity and urban identity. And four, inclusiveness helps planners to understand how places form, evolve, or survive and support transculturalism and better serve diverse communities. Um, I heartily agree, agree and support the need for city bureaucratic regimes to better understand how civic open spaces can support transculturalism, give pushback to homogenization, and the creation of identity. Also, they need to recognize that they can offset a lot of the negative impacts of gentrification if they create a process. This is what Jason was talking about with that as a goal. John Fry, who I've worked with, who is now the president of Drexel University and the past president of the University of Pennsylvania, has done this brilliantly with one of the poorest neighborhoods in Philadelphia as he worked to expand these campuses. And it provides an excellent model for actually how this can be done. But the question is, really, how fundamentally speaking to us, is how do you or we, as artists and makers of physical form, ensure that this happens? And that, my friends, is my own dilemma that I've never figured out nor been able to reconcile. I'm actually with you asking the same qu questions after practicing for 35 years. I will speak as suggested about my own involvement 
with the impact of the 1996 bombing and to present MSP's contribution to the Millennium Quarter and to speak about the topics of identity and process. In terms of process, I believe that the first misstep by the city was that we, MSP, won this project as a result of a competition. Now, I, I'm not saying that um, it was necessarily a mistake that we won it, but what I'm saying is that competitions are not the way, I believe, that a city and its peoples and communities are best served, especially if they're competitions for public urban space. Competitions are always an indicator of a top-down endeavor and is, by the nature of its structure, not inclusive. You have people, like myself, far away and unknowledgeable, like myself, designing spaces with almost no information about what is really happening on the ground, politically, socially, economically, or culturally. But the decisions to have a competition is made by the people at the city who are empowered to make these decisions and are at a high level with the, within the power structure. So here's a rule. Do not run competitions in public realm design if you want an inclusive process. Hire on a team and structure it so that inclusiveness is possible. Cities should invite designers to come with a blank page that can be shaped through community meetings. And we have done many projects like that when the city planning departments have structured this process. However, again, it's the leadership which shapes the process. It's not determined by the designers who have been hired on to design spaces. We are essentially hired guns. I can tell you that only a few of the public projects I've worked on, however, have been structured so that we can actually meet with the citizens and, and interest groups. I consider these cities that do have, do produce these structures to be enlightened and actually have politicians and planners who are also enlightened. But as a designer, I cannot demand that they do so, as these people are usually appointed by people who are elected to office through a democratic process. So the one way you can get more enlightened leadership is by voting them in. I can tell you that in dictatorships, community involvement is not on the table, and you're on your own with the dictator. So what are your choices as a designer? First, you could choose to only work with an enlightened city government and planning regime. If so, I suggest that you don't give up your day job. And the other reality is that you won't make much of a change to how things really run. Your second choice is to actually give up being an artist or designer and become an enlightened planner or politician, like the mayor of Reykjavik. Or if you can't do that and you want to stick to your art and design, go with the flow and try to make changes from within. As an artist or designer, you will have to deal with your own art artistic ego and desire to make things. Can you control your inner urge to make physical things even if the process is flawed? And is it possible that what you make in spite of a flawed system could actually bring positive change? I believe that art and design can make important change and it's essential to the evolution of culture. Perhaps one can make the best out of a situation and still make a contribution even if it can't accomplish all that you wish. That is our stance or my stance we are most often in position where although the process is flawed and not under our control, we do try to make the best of the situation, try to make change from within, and to push to make something of value to the community and to the environment. And that was the case in Manchester, as you will see. Now, um, in terms of our involvement, you can see that, well, we were supposed to design a space that was really part of the Millennium Master Plan, if I go back, that was an excellent plan done by EDA. Um, using the bomb blast as an opportunity for positive action, the city leaders saw an opportunity to re regenerate not a square, but a back-end service street characterized by leftover space between good, bad, and ugly buildings, but certainly a no-man's land an ugly landscape of indifference and perhaps poverty. 
It was a lower middle class shopping district that was deemed to be underachieving its potential given the central location within the city. The leadership wished to recreate an identity that had devolved over time and was finished off by the bomb blast in 1996. Redefining its identity was the task that we had to tackle sitting, isolated, and unable to communicate without asking the questions of the competition directors, which is why I say competitions are not a great way for going about designing public spaces, but also a great way for city leaders to get ideas on the cheap. The economic goal for the creation of Exchange Square was to monetize this district and to attract business. The space was to function as a destination and as a place where retail would flourish. Office space would be rented and residential development would be encouraged to return to an ailing center city. Within the competition's remit, there was no ambition to serve transculturalism, as globalization had not impacted Manchester yet, and to better or to serve diverse communities, as this was and always has been a place of exchange and commerce, and lower income communities were farther out of the city center. Nor did my scope or contract involve any community participation. If this was done, and I'm not sure whether it was or it wasn't, it was done by the team above me and the planning department. But I don't know how this was handled as I was farther down the food, food chain than I had ever imagined. Decisions about how the space was to function economically, whether the space can have an environmental benefit, have an appropriate budget for maintenance, have an appropriate budget for the use of high quality materials that are durable and sustainable, are all decisions that have been determined before I ever showed up. I'm not criticizing bureaucrats or planners at all, as this level of planning must be done by people who are qualified, knowledgeable, and who we vote in to make difficult and measured decisions. Whether they are the right-minded people to do this is always the issue. My job, however, is to understand the remit and then design a place that will serve the client's objectives, as well as our own professional objectives in terms of making it a responsible civic space that has an environmental and an aesthetic agenda. Our duty as designers is to educate and push for the inclusion of crucial elements that may have been overlooked within the scope, including setting up processes that would work better, which we did. And some of them we were successful with, and in some important ones we were not successful with. Our own objectives and ethos within MSP is to first understand a site, determine what is needed, and to create a design that is specific to its place, so to reflect and draw upon its identity. This is a part of our firm's DNA. Every place we design is necessarily, due to its site specificity, different. In the case of Exchange Square, its identity had evolved for centuries and had many historic identities. When trans the transformation of the Millennium Quarter began, it was a dross landscape characterized by the harshness of post-war planning and architecture of modernism. This unfortunate era was finished off by the IRA bomb blast of 1996. If there was ever a blank page, this was it. Its identity would have to be recreated. It was a decision not to attempt to reach back into past identities of the space, for there were many, and one, one would have to choose which part of history would be represented, a slippery slope for anyone trying to recreate the past, and to not create some ersatz version of what medieval Manchester might have been, but to start where we were in time. It would be a contemporary space, as this is the only way one can achieve an identity that is authentic, something I feel is extremely important if a design is to serve both the past, the present, and the future. Identity cannot be seen only through a looking glass into the past, but in many cases, where it has been wiped clean must be created for the future. This is the case for many developing countries, especially those whose histories have been wiped clean, such as in China. In these situations, and I include Exchange Square, the recreation of new civic spaces are emanations of how people wish to see themselves by others and now. The issues of identity and what made Manchester Manchester was an extremely important topic for us. 
Site specificity underpins our work, and we always try to find a narrative. And this is something that John was talking about, a story that connects the design of the site to its context. We always carry out in-depth research on our sites to try to grasp what its underpinnings are and what forces acted upon it and are still acting upon it. Okay, the competition. I will briefly go through some images of the Exchange Square of competition, not for the purposes of showing the square to you, because you all know it, we're right here, um, but for the purpose of speaking to the symposium's questions. Um, the first step, as I said, was this competition. You see that we actually submitted two designs for the competition. And the reason we did this is that there were some fundamental questions we had to ask, because we didn't know, but we had nobody to ask it of. So we actually made two different designs that really pointed out what the issues were. Actually, design, you use design as a way of learning about what a site is through the interaction with others so you can ask these questions. That's why inclusive, inclusiveness is important. So to your left, you see actually one scheme that is preferring the open space to what was then Marks and Spencer's, which was the, con uh, the con continuation of the retail district. So it was, well, which space should be preferred? The one to the right is, okay, well, maybe it's the space in front of the Corn Exchange building, by far the most like, an historically important building on the square. Perhaps the Corn Exchange space should be preferred. I don't know. I'm, how am I supposed to know which one is the right way to go? But these are fundamental issues that needed to be asked but couldn't. But anyway, um, we did win the competition to the left-hand side, where evidently the space in front of the Marks and Spencer's store was going to be the important space, which was actually geographically one story above the corn exchange space. So here you see these, these were the competition entries. Um, yes, there are palm trees in here. I'll just explain a little bit, not too much time on that. But here again was this idea of the lower plaza. So that's what I'm saying is that if I had been able to have a conversation, we probably may have been able, maybe it would have been completely different than it is today, who knows, but there would have been a conversation. So I just want to go over the, the narrative of this really, really quickly in case you guys don't know, which you probably don't know, because in one case, who cares? I mean, I need that in order for us to be able to design, but we did a lot of research. What did we find out? The hanging ditch is there for a geological reason. It's the edge of a Yorkstone outcropping uh, upon which the cathedral district sits, which is why there was a ditch there in the first place. So that's why there's a, a, a curve there, that's why there was a flume there, is that it was a result of the way the, the, land, the land actually was. Um, we made a gesture of knitting these two sections of the city, the upper shopping district that was by that time made out of granite, steel, and glass, which are the, uh, the uh, materials we used, and the lower cathedral district, which was built out of York, or York stone and on a York stone uh, cro outcropping. Uh, the other kind of story that we discovered was that, uh, yes, we know this was the nexus of the Industrial Revolution, um, but what was interesting is that without the introduction of trains and the use of trains to distribute the goods, Manchester wouldn't have gotten rich because there wouldn't have been any way of distributing them. So we thought that this was kind of an, maybe an unsung story of the importance of the train, the trains and the, the role they played in Manchester. So beach, train yard, whatever, but this was really kind of this idea that we would kind of weave that story into it. Now, we had other things that were really important to us. We had unearthed a lot of very interesting junk going through the, the, the excavation. We suggested light boxes that would be built into the stone walls. This idea was rejected. I don't know why. I don't know why. You'll see a lot of decisions were made here, but the, I think the most activating part of this is the way that these two areas were stitched together using very gentle ramps that really kind of came off of Cathedral Way, is it? Is that right, Jason? Cathedral Street? I can't even remember. Because, you know, coming out of that area and then dispersing people across the, 
the site and down, and that these, um, these ramps were really held by these very wide stone benches that were kind of an act of generosity where people could sit, they could sit on both sides of them, they could leg down, they could skateboard on them. Yes, I was very, I am still pro skateboarders. Um, and, uh, and then really revealing the hanging ditch again. So these, these were the kind of the underlying kind of elements of the space. And again, here is like back in the day before um, changes started to happen in there, these spaces were used and the benches were brilliant. People could come, they could picnic on them, they could lay down on them, they could straddle them, they could face each other. It was a much more democratic space. It was a place for creativity. You could perform on them. It was an invitation for people to make their own ways of using public space. Uh, yeah, that kind of uh, ended up not happening, but this is how it did function for a while. I was very pleased to see people just using them in any way they wanted. The hanging ditch became a very interesting kind of topic of study with CAVE in terms of how much a city would be willing to take a risk. Because actually, risk is fun. Risk attracts people. It invites you to play, interacting with people, getting people involved to do things with the space is what makes a space attractive and fun. And um, actually, yeah, this is still a very popular kind of play toy for all sorts of things to happen. Um, yeah, so this has actually been a very, very important space. And um, I mean, Jason talked, I have to put this in, but Jason did speak about this as a uh, part of uh, a um, part of the Museum of Modern Art exhibition where the museums uh, chose 30, 30 spaces from around the world as being kind of the best spaces in that time, 2005. And when the curator, curators went to look at the various spaces and photograph them, they came back and they said, well, we still want to include Exchange Square, but we actually were sorry to tell you that the space has been ruined. We can't use any of the photos that we would have to take today. Do you have any old photos? Because of what had been done to Exchange Square, it had kind of uh, fallen, out, fallen off the, you know, it's, it, was, it was pretty defaced. So again, here are the trains, uh, train benches that were actually made out of train parts that we found here in the city. Uh, we wanted these to roll back and forth, but uh, that was de deemed too um, risky. But again, it's part of this narrative. And then finally, I will say something about the, uh, the pinwheels. I know that um, the, the general consensus is that I don't like the pinwheels. And, I have to say that it's really more of a sour grape story. I was really pissed off that nobody, after they rejected my palm trees, uh, nobody actually talked to me about the pinwheels. I wasn't even consulted about it. I didn't know it was a competition. It, would it work with the general idea of the, of the plaza? I mean, talking about interactivity, I mean, nothing. It was radio silence. So I think I was pretty pissed off about it. But in reality, these things, I think, work very well in front of the, the, the store, I mean, it was kind of in, in keeping with where these vertical elements and sculptural items were placed. Let me just speak to you about the palm trees. Um, the city was right. Uh, they had nothing to do with Manchester, and that was precisely why they were palm trees. There isn't any rule that says, as an artist and designer, everything actually has to be about a certain place, has a certain narrative. I mean. That was a work of Dada art. I mean, did Duchamp's toilet belong in the museum? No. Did it change the way we viewed art? Yes. So is there a problem with that? Actually changing people's ideas about what Manchester is? Anyway, I'll just <laughs> ask that this question. Anyway, OK, so my next one is called Defacement and the Quest for More Money. So um, I, don't have a, I don't have a problem that uh, the, the space with its excellent master plan was there in order to bring back people and life and generate an economy. Um, okay, my beef is what happened afterwards uh, to, this, uh, to the square. And I have to say that um, all of these things that happened to it, I was never consulted, I was never asked, 
I would go and trawl the, the internet every once in a while to see what the next hit would, would be to take to this square. This first one was shocking to me. Um, this was obviously about uh, disabling skateboarders. Um, and it's, you know, particularly, look, yeah, I have sons. Uh, young boys. I mean, no retailers like have young guys hanging around, right? Because they're just troublemakers. It's better to keep them out on the neighborhoods kind of where they belong. But this was a really heavy-handed and intrusive assault. It was an army of steel fixers attached to the stone. But the saddest part about it, besides being defaced in the most aggressive way, was that this regimentation really disallowed more leisurely and perhaps more democratic usages as intended. Instead, people are now forced to sit in a more formalized structure as if they're in a movie theater. This is done exactly, as I said, without the courtesy even calling me to ask if, well, is there some other way we might have done this which wouldn't wreck the whole design? Uh, no, I wasn't called. So anyway, it demonstrated the city's view of designers as simply someone who comes in to color in between the lines and then, you know, dismissed. So the people who actually asked us to come to do this did not seem to value the contribution that we made in terms of what was created for the city. Their actions upon the plaza illustrated their lack of value for art and design. I just think maybe they're just not tremendously cultured people. I, that's just my own take on it, and what this space offered to the city or could have offered to the city. I mean, it was managed so that it wouldn't scare away the shoppers, basically. Someone must have told them that they should hire good designers, and honestly, without Jason there to explain what we were doing and soothe kind of the feathers, it wouldn't have gotten designed. Right, Jason? I know this, so thank you very much. I mean, Jason really enabled the design to happen because nobody would necessarily trust, trust me and why should they? I kind of came in from outer space. But um, cities who move forward have leaders who understand the value of arts and creativity to move the cities forward socially and culturally. This understanding also creates support and protection of these valuable offerings such as Exchange Square especially the civic spaces, which are the most vulnerable of all the built environment. Okay, this is, well, this one really hurt, but this next one really, I couldn't, I couldn't believe that the city fathers thought that this was a good idea. Really? I mean, didn't London have a London Eye? Is this Manchester? I mean, really, guys? I mean. I mean, if it's ever a, a signal that this is a wannabe city, you don't do this. Anyway, um, this was the largest and most profound degradation. And it was supposed to be temporary, but it wasn't. It's clumsily installed, and it dwarfed its tiny space. Exchange Square is small. And this was a severe and aggressive defacement of the space, demoting it from a true civic space of dignity and grace into a carnival ground and where anything goes. And actually, anything did go. I mean, this is a hideous piece of what? It's not sculpture, it's a sign. Who said that was OK? Is, is there anybody watching here? Really, well, was there? I mean, if, and if they were, who are they? I mean, I'd like names, actually. Because I'm pissed. I'm really pissed off about this. I mean, really. Um, I mean, disgraceful. And it just kept on going. Uh, the train benches disappeared, everything. Now, the corn exchange actually didn't escape either. This was treated as a billboard. Um, the, I can say that the ironies of Exchange Square are many. The purpose of monetizing the center of the city to attract business and a higher tone shopping area worked very well, and it was what was needed. However, it was the relentless lust for money that reduced the square to a horizontal billboard. The leadership turned a blind eye. Yes, I wrote lots of letters, made phone calls. I don't know, maybe they lost it. 
Without the leadership understanding the value the space could play to the greater city, they ended up killing the golden goose. There is no mystery as to why the corn exchange retail did not work. It had become a degraded place where high-end retail wouldn't come. But is it successful? OK. As defined by the leadership of the time at the city, I believe the space has been extremely successful. What has our part been? MSB has been part of bringing an economy to the middle of the city. I'm very proud about that. I believe that this was much needed. Was this space abused and maltreated in the stampede for yet more money? Yes. Were the other benefits of the city in terms of creating an identity made? Yes. Was this benefit ignored or even more monetized out of greed? Yes. Did this monetization have a trickle-down effect to assist struggling outer neighborhoods? Could this square have been improved through inclusiveness? Well, on both counts, well, I know there was no trickle-down because trickle-down doesn't work. Ronald Reagan proved that. But in terms of inclusiveness, I don't know about that because around this site, as was said, there was nothing. Um, the, it was the Arnsdale Center that was on its last legs, the new Marks and Spencers and an empty corn exchange. It was a desert. However, in spite of all the indignities and humiliations this space has suffered, I believe it has provided some of the more civic-minded goals MSP had hoped to attain and the creation of an identity. Although I fought hard not to have the space needlessly harmed, and most recently by having it, the hanging ditch's nose cut off in order for people to find the front door to the corn exchange, which could and was easily done by changing the nature of the door, I am still glad that the junk that defaced and devalued the space has been removed. Of course, this, again, was not to preserve an important space of identity for the city's citizenship, but for the pay people who are going to be paying for the expensive rooms in a new and beautiful hotel, who will not wish to tolerate the carnival outside their rooms. Folks, unless you have people in power who have other values, than simply making money and understand by supporting all the people who make up a community, including poor people, in the regeneration process, money will always be the driver behind development and regeneration. Okay, the question posed in the symposium brief makes the assumption that designers have the power to determine crucial decisions that shape the city. I'm deconstructing this process to highlight a few basic strategic facts. One, designers are not autonomous. Two, they function with a larger political, within a larger political and social condition. Three, planning and design are influenced by much larger political and social trends, which can be seen throughout history. Four, there needs to be a political will to make complex and dynamic place identity formation and to actively support places that engender transculturalism and serve diverse communities. And to do this, you need enlightened leadership, or bottom-up can be organized to persuade the power possessors. If they do not, then these, decision, these, these decisions will be in the hands of those who have been voted into power and have the responsibility to make these decisions. The poorest people in the society, and this is very true in the United States, tend not to vote. Therefore, their vote influences the least. It's the middle class that tends to vote more, and thus their decisions are carried out. The poor and less enfranchised people, are, to, if they are to have a greater say, they and others must help to strengthen their voices through organized efforts. This has been very well demonstrated in London in Brixton's Angel Town, where the community self-organized, raised funds, and revitalized a whole previously toxic public housing block. Yes, people can have power if they organize themselves to pressure those people who are in power. Okay, Art School 101, I have to say, I graduated from art school and um, always wanted to make art, so I'm kind of one of those people. And even though we are not politicians, creatives are fundamental to moving culture forward. Artists and designers, by nature, challenge the status quo, react to and engage change, present new ideas, expand our culture's notion of what is beautiful, and reflect 
or are critical of who we are today. Artists provide a culture's moral compass. In terms of form giving and visual expressions of ideas, concepts, and aesthetics, it is, however, the specifics of the art or design that will play a huge factor in whether anything sustains over time and whether people make, most importantly, an emotional attachment to place. It can shape a person's identity, perhaps a much more important benefit than uplifting a city's identity. A city's public realm landscapes needs to be designed to be more than merely functional or as a billboard for retail, but as a wonderful, inspired, attractive place that serves civic life and works for all socioeconomic levels. Art and design in themselves cannot make cities successful, as cities are a very complex layering of moving parts. However, for a city to function maximally, the design quality of a city's public realm components becomes extremely important. Design and artistic quality is a crucial factor in whether a city can reach its fullest potential. In this way, I believe Exchange Square has not been allowed to achieve its fullest potential for the city. But let's see what happens to it in the next 20 years. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. going to enjoy that. Um, yeah, defacement's an interesting thing. Uh, uh, those of us uh, uh, with, with good, efficient memories will remember the, uh, the obelisk on Market Street. And in fact, they might never have told you that, um, that, that where you were working, where Exchange Square was about to be created, uh, there was a bandstand. Uh, but the bandstand was introduced onto the site long after bands had ceased to exist. And it was largely a plastic bandstand out of the same catalogue that came the obelisk uh, at the top of Market Street, uh, which now incidentally sits in Crumpsall Park, um, overlooked by Richard Lees because he lives overlooking the park. So there it is every day to remind the leader of the City Council that not all decisions are good decisions.